friends, and welcome back to the Rewind podcast of Forward Church. Join us each week as we take a look back on Sunday's message and dig a little deeper into the conversations with those who are teaching across our sites at Forward. We want to invite you to be part of the conversation too. So if something we're talking about on Sunday morning sparks a question in you, head to our website forwardchurch.ca slash ask us and submit your questions there. And we're going to do our best to engage with those questions in this space. With that said, let's jump in and get started. Hey, Rewind listeners, a little bit different uh, Rewind version for us today. Pastor Kirk and I are here today, and if you were with us on Sunday, then you would know that we had a celebration Sunday this past Sunday, and it was fantastic across all of our sites, including our microsite in Ingersoll. So much to celebrate. Why don't you start by just sharing a little bit? You were in Cambridge, so Yeah, I was in Cambridge. We had a great Sunday in Cambridge this week. Uh, Just... We had baptisms. We had a couple of baptisms in Cambridge. We had uh, a study through Joshua 4 and just people even bringing some stones up to the front yeah. as this reminder of ways that God's shown himself to be faithful over this past year. It was just a deeply moving service. And then uh, after the service, had a big party. Uh, afterwards, got an ice cream truck that got lost and didn't make it to the church. (laughs) For everyone who was looking for their ice cream on Sunday, the ice cream truck somehow managed to make his way to St. Catharines. So there's a church in St. Catharines who was very excited on Sunday, but uh, we lost out. But Beaver Tails was here and we... We did not pay for their ice cream. We did not pay for... That's right. No, let's be clear. (laughs) Beaver Tails was here. We had a great time. Kids were outside playing. We had some bouncy castles and it was just... uh, Uh, an incredible party and celebration as a church family here in Cambridge. And also shout out to Ingersoll. We had two baptisms happen in Ingersoll as well this past Sunday. So it was a great time. And you were in Kitchener celebrating 10th anniversary of Kitchener. It was. It was. So uh, we celebrated a little later. We wanted to get some better weather. Uh, I think it was March 25th of 2012 you was didn't want to eat outside in March. No, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> You're like a Canadian. I know. So we waited uh, and decided to celebrate uh, and celebrate the end of the ministry year with really a, a celebration of 10 ministry years in Kitchener and of God's faithfulness. Billy put together a wonderful video of some people just sharing their testimonies through the year, new and old people to Forward Kitchener. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, and then afterwards, as is very fitting, as we find ourselves in the middle of uh, the covenant <laughs> uh, and all of God's commands regarding ritual holiness for the Old Testament people that we celebrated with a pig <laughs> roasted on us. But so we're as we like... celebrated freedom in Christ and a new covenant people. Okay, so. there you go. There's the justification. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, delicious. Uh, had some cake there, had the bouncy castle, uh, there was an inflatable axe throwing, and just wonderful to hang out with people and celebrate all that God has done. So. Yeah, it was such a great weekend, and uh, we just again say thank you to everyone yeah. in our church family who has helped to make the past year possible. Yeah, and so because of that, you know, uh, Pastor Kirk and I sat down a couple weeks before and said, Priestly garments, huh? Uh, <laughs> celebration Sunday. So, sounds like a good thing to celebrate. I'm just not sure that we're going to be able to make this fit and do justice to the text or justice to the morning that had been planned. And so what we said we would do is we would not leave this passage behind because all scripture is God breathed and we think there's value here for us. And we know that some of you are like, fill in the blanks people and it would drive you absolutely crazy that we didn't fill in this blank. So we're going to spend some time just walking through the text today sharing I think a little bit of our observations of the text, maybe giving a little bit of an inside peek into how we wrestle around with a text, especially a text that maybe seems a little either dry or dull or odd or however people perceive it Mm -hmm. and say, but there's value here for us. So how do we understand that? How do we get to that? And what is it that God wants to say to us through his word? Absolutely. This is 
there are passages in the Bible when you read the Bible, and and there are passages. I'll be honest that you kind of skim, I skim over yeah. sometimes. Yeah, because, we all skim over. Everybody puts that, up their hands. Yeah, because you wonder like, why on earth has God yeah. put this in the Scripture? And so the opportunity to continue to dive into the importance of these words, uh, I think is so essential for us. So I know I joked in Cambridge about those of you who are sick and twisted and want to know about priestly garments. <laughs> so I welcome you to the podcast today, yeah. those of you who are in that <laughs> spot. And uh, those of you who didn't know that's what we were going to talk about, uh, I think uh, you're going to enjoy this. Uh, if you were just hoping we'd talk beaver tails, bouncy castles, right. and, right. and pig roast the whole time. So just hang with us. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be good. I, like, I really am looking forward to this conversation and uh, a bit of a glimpse into how we study God's Word. So give us some context where we've yeah. been, Derek, and yeah. where we are. So just to, if you have maybe weren't with us the week before, or the last couple of weeks, or maybe you've forgotten everything's gone on. Remember, we talked about remembering and the importance of remembering this past week. But so yeah. let us help you remember. <laughs> uh, we are with the people at Mount Sinai. They finally got to the place that God has called them to, to worship him. And the people have agreed to renew the covenant with God to say, we will be your covenant people. We will do all that you command. And now Moses heads up into the clouds on Sinai and God begins to give him instructions. And last week we looked at the tabernacle instructions and that carries right on into instructions around the priesthood, how they were to be clothed um, and then how they were to be consecrated as a priesthood for him. Yeah, it's fascinating how God cares so much about even the clothing, even down mm -hmm. to the underwear. Yeah, right, right down like, to the underwear. It's it's fascinating. Because uh, when you step up on the steps, if you had to step up on the steps, right. you didn't want to be ashamed, right? right? And there's just that throwback to the Garden of Eden and mm -hmm. this picture of of nakedness representing our shame before God, yep. and you didn't want to have that shame right. of your nakedness. So, yeah, it is fascinating to me as we dive into this. So we're in Exodus 28, for yes. those of you uh, who want to maybe open up a Bible and uh, uh, follow along with yeah, us. Or just fact check us. It. Yeah, or <laughs> Google us. Google will tell you what's true. <laughs> so, Kirk, why don't you maybe give us kind of... A 30,000 foot view, as you kind of read through this, um, what, what do you think God is telling us about himself, about humanity, and, and the big ideas of the text here? Yeah, I think when I, when I look at this whole text, it's continuing to tell us how, um, uh, how much God cares about what it takes for us to come into his presence. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and so he establishes this priesthood and he gives some very specific instructions for the priests uh, and all with the idea of representing us or representing the Israelites in his presence. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it continues just to carry on this whole idea of the importance of a priest not only having all the right clothing and everything else, but this picture that even the priests needed to be consecrated because yeah. they weren't perfect. There were yeah. things that had to be set aside in their life, which gives us this continued picture of uh, God could either keep an old system where you have a whole new set of priests that keep coming along, imperfect people who need to be consecrated, uh, or or there could be somebody else who could do it for us once and for all yeah. and, and be that representative that makes it possible for us to come into God's presence. And, and this idea of a mediator between God and man, and that's really what the priest's role was mm -hmm. for the Israelites. So, yeah, at a high level, that that's really where I see God going with this. I mean, there's a lot more details, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was, you know, just continue to be struck by this tension of the holiness of God, right? Mm -hmm. That God is holy and other and cannot have sin mm -hmm. be not dealt with, can't have sin enter into his presence, and yet his deep desire to be present with the sinful people. Yep. And this is this tension that can only end up, as you were mentioning, ends up being resolved in Christ. Yeah. The, the, the grace of God, his love for uh, the people who is created in his image, and yet his holiness, which demands judgment and justice on sin. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, 
it's a theme we've seen throughout, right? right? Over the last number of weeks as we've journeyed through Exodus is how holy God is. One of the things that I think is important for us to remember is whenever something is repeated in yeah. the Bible, there's a reason. That, yeah. Like as a parent, if if there are things you deeply care about as a parent, you keep telling your kids right. the same thing over yeah. and over yep. again. You know, however many times you've told your kids, eat your vegetables or don't cross the street without looking. Yeah. It, there are just things you keep repeating. This God's the same way. Like there are things God wants us to grasp. And and that tension you talked about, I think, is really what God wants us to grasp, his holiness and and how he is so unique and different uh, and perfect compared to us. And we can't come to his presence unless he somehow makes a way for it to be possible. And yet he wants us there. That's the part for me that is consistent. I can wrap, I can try to wrap my head around God's holiness. Yeah. I have a really hard time wrapping around, wrapping my head around why God wants to hang out with me. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So it, it's, it's amazing to see this continue to play itself out in Exodus. Yeah. I, you know, I was, I think this is kind of a neat opportunity for us to share as we're working through a passage you know what are we what are we looking for what are we looking at and that idea of repetition that is one of the things i'm always looking for as i'm going through yeah. a passage what do i see repeated here in, in the broad scope of scripture what themes am i seeing repeated but then in a specific passage and one of the things that was jumping out to me is in the garments that the high priest would put on the number 12 and the the names mm -hmm. of the tribes being put mm -hmm. on the jewels and on the shoulders mm -hmm. And this idea that the priest, as he puts on these clothes, is taking on the identity of the people. He represents yep. the people as he comes into the presence of God. Not, it's not just Aaron. Yeah. It doesn't just represent Aaron, but he represents all of Israel. And I, I loved that same picture as well uh, in, in the passage. We're, we're down in verses 12 and 15 of yep. uh, Exodus 28. Because to me, it gave this incredible picture of, yeah, he's taking on the identity of, of the children of Israel and he's representing the Israelites to God. But think about what you put on your shoulders. Like if I said, I'm going to carry you on my shoulders. Yep. All right. That means you are essentially helpless. You need me to carry mm -hmm. you. But then if I say, um, I'm going to put something over my heart. Yeah. It is this endearing quality of like, I treasure you. Yeah. And, and this idea of a priest who is carrying the people on his shoulders and carrying the people in his heart yeah. is, uh, I thought, man, what a beautiful picture ultimately of what Jesus does for us, yeah. right? Because Jesus carries us on his shoulders. We can't come to the Father apart from Jesus, but he does it because he also carries us in his heart. Yeah. And uh, it's just, I, I love that. Love that picture. That... Um... Reminds me of another thing that I'm always looking for, especially as I enter into an Old Testament passage, mm -hmm. is I'm looking for Jesus. Yeah. Right? So I'm looking for repetition, and I'm looking for Jesus. We read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Right. We read the Old Testament look knowing now that Jesus is the fulfillment, and that everything there is signpost pointing towards Jesus. And so yeah. that when Kirk and I kind of jump to Jesus, because we're looking in here and saying, what, what is pointing forward to Jesus? And, you know, if you're going to read this, it's great to go through and read Hebrews. Absolutely. Because Jesus, yep. over and over again in Hebrews, is referred to as our great high priest. Yeah. He's the ultimate fulfillment here of the priesthood. Uh, and anything else that jumped out to you as you're reading? Well, I, I just, you know, the whole idea of looking at Hebrews, if you're brand new to the Bible and, you know, you're not used to, you're trying just to read Exodus in isolation, yeah. it can easily be very confusing. And so the book of Hebrews is a huge help in terms of helping you to interpret the book of Exodus yeah. uh, in today's reality. Yeah. And today, so you'll often see us in a sermon We'll preach in Exodus, but many times we're bringing you to the book of Exodus, to a passage in the book. Of, and there's a reason for that, because uh, Hebrews helps us interpret yeah. Exodus. The consistent thing that uh, you're looking at in any narrative, which Exodus is mm -hmm. a, a narrative, I think, I, I'm looking for, um, what is this telling me about God? Mm -hmm. um, what is this telling me about 
uh, who people are and how people are responding. And because those are two things God. that don't change. Right. Those yeah. things don't change. <laughs> so I'm looking for those kind of core elements. And then, then I'm looking for kind of the, the piece that ties those two things together, which is the, w what is God saying that needs to happen here in order for God and his people to be able to be connected with each other? Yeah. Because it's all, it, you, you see this pattern over and over again in narratives of, of God, God's people or people who God has called to be his people and then a disconnect yeah. that happens and God coming and stepping into the story and bringing a solution mm -hmm. to reconnect uh, the relationship between him and his people. One of the things that uh, I thought in reading the passage, uh, as you go through uh, 28 and you're reading through the garments, you get to uh, the part where it says in the breastplate, he had I always... Urim and Thummim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the words you want to skip over when somebody yeah. asks you to read the Bible. And uh, I thought to myself, I wish I had some Urim and Thummim. <laughs> because Urim and Thummim, what they were was, this. These were it was kind of like decision-making dice or... Mm -hmm. uh, it was sovereignly ordained by God. The priests would kind of pull these out, and this is how they would know God's will outside. Wouldn't it be wonderful <laughs> when we were up against a big decision mm -hmm. to be able to pull out the umim and It would thumim. be. <laughs> Roll some dice and see what happens. That's right. But I don't think we can draw that no, over to you picking up some dice nobody, and rolling it. Nobody go and roll. If you lose a hundred bucks because of that, you can, his email address is Derek Gaff at Forward Church. That's yeah. It. I mean, we, I, I know Kirk, myself, we often get questions about God's will and how do I know God's will? And I, I'd say part of the reason we don't have that is because we have the a greater fullness of God's right. word in front of us. Yeah. Uh, so that's where we go first to get the big principles. And then uh, I would say when we're trying to understand God's will, um, he gives us a lot of leeway. And I know yeah. you and I have talked about this before is like, if you're walking in obedience to him yeah. and listening to his spirit, there are times where he just says, okay, well, it's your choice. It's true. <laughs> go, it's, go ahead. <laughs> one of the things when you're when you're counseling people or when you're discipling people or mentoring people, they will often ask, like, just tell me what to do. Yeah. Get, they get, want you to right, be the umim and thum. Right. Right. So so I, I I've spoken with a few people recently who have just said, here's my problem. Tell me the three things I need to do. Yeah. And usually I go, mm, I don't know. But here's some biblical principles to guide you, but yeah. you, you need to make some decisions for yourself and and don't live in the space of this fear of... The whole of the cosmic order yeah, is going like to break down. God <laughs> is suddenly going to fall off his throne because you made the wrong decision. Yeah, you chose cornflakes rather than Rice Krispies yeah, in the morning. Like God, God's not sweating that. It's okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think people, you're right. Like sometimes we get held back by this sense of, uh, every everything needs to be according to God's will, and that means God's will has to be in every decision, including what cereal I yeah. take in the morning. Yeah, and if it doesn't, like, what if I choose the what if it's like the right. butterfly effect? I choose yeah. the wrong cereal, and war breaks out someplace. That's right. right. It's <laughs> I have this conversation <laughs> many times with with uh, teens and young adults as they're thinking about who to date and who to marry, yeah. and you just like imagine the cascade event if. God yeah. didn't have this stuff under control and you chose the wrong. Now somebody else has got the wrong person in it. All it's a just... mess. <laughs> and, then the, and then the kid that was supposed to be born doesn't right. get born. And what a mess. <laughs> so no, don't live in that space. <laughs> Set yourself free from those kinds of things. One of the things I, I found really interesting yeah. in the passage about the priest garments yep. is the part about the robe being hemmed with bells. It was kind of like, yeah. it's kind of like, like when your kids were little and you would want to put something on them so that you knew they were, like right. if they were lost and you had to try and find yep. them, it was that same kind of idea. And the, in uh, verse 35, I think it is, um, it talks about uh, on Aaron when he ministers, uh, these yep. bells are on him uh, so that its sound can be heard when he goes into the holy place and when he comes out so that he doesn't die. This idea that there's only one person that could wear these bells. It was the one who went into the holy place. Yeah. And uh, 
uh, you know, I thought, well, does God... Is he sneaking up on him? Yeah, like, <laughs> God needs me to wear bells so that I, like, you know, but I don't, I don't think that's what it's talking about there at all. I think it's, it's this idea that it's a picture to the rest of the people that there was a need for somebody to be go in on be, on yeah. behalf of them right yeah. and and again he's representing the people and the holiness of god is so great uh, we've already seen that right yeah. i mean at the at the base of the mountain as the people are there he, he has to tell them multiple times make sure the people don't begin to come up and get past where they ought to be on the mountain or i'm going to break out against them as right. like a n- nuclear bomb is going to go off yeah so yeah. you get this constant reminder of these bells that, you know, as much as it's important that you see and you're aware that there's a priest that's going before you, these bells were this audible reminder yep. to the people that uh, they weren't allowed to go into God's presence. It was only the priest who was able to go there on his, on their behalf. Yeah. I One of the things as I was reading through right at the beginning in, in chapter 20, this whole idea that God institutes a priesthood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we we live in a time, I think, of, in, in many ways, rightly, uh, skepticism around yep. authority. Yep. Um, but what we see throughout Scripture is that authority is given by God. Sometimes authority is given by God and it's misused by the people that God gives it yep. to. But the solution is not to discard the idea of societal authority. And so I was just thinking through this whole idea of, um, yeah, how offices, how authorities matter to God. and uh, But what we see here is that authority without character mm-hmm. will ultimately lead to death and destruction. See, I've always struggled with um, talking about authority or teaching about authority. Yeah. Primarily because I know I'm sitting in a position of sure. authority. Yeah. And and so there's a little bit of this reality of of going like uh, Are you trying to reinforce yeah, your position? Like, yeah. So it's yeah. this sense of saying to people, you you need to you need to like submit to my authority, almost like this this royal command coming from me. Yeah. Um, and there are definitely ways that you can abuse that. Yeah. You know, the flip side of that is that as a as a teacher and a leader, to not talk about it mm-hmm. is to fail to teach the whole counsel of God's word. Yep. Right. And I think what you what you're pointing out there is such an important point that God has established authority. And uh, yes, authority can mess it up. Yeah. Authority can make a, some big mistakes sometimes, which kind of ties into this reinforcing of the need for the priest to be consecrated. Well, that's what I was going to say. So um, (laughs) two of the individuals who are consecrated here, they are not going to last as priests. Right. uh, Because they are not going to live under submission to God. And God is the ultimate authority. And God is not going to allow authority to run amok Forever. Yep. And so two of Aaron's sons in Leviticus chapter 10 don't respond, do the things that they have been told to do, and they are actually burned up in flames by God. Right. Uh, and it's just, again, this reminder that, like, we can trust God because God's the ultimate authority. He puts authorities in place and he will hold authorities accountable, which is also a relief to us, yeah. right? Like, Yes, hold we in a democratic society we have certain opportunities and obligations to hold authorities accountable, but we never have to walk in fear that God doesn't know what's going on or that He won't do what is just in the end. Yeah, how do you how do you reconcile? I know a lot of people wrestle with this yeah. question. How do you reconcile this idea of a God who would burn up some people in flames? Sure. Yeah, I mean, how I reconcile it is. <laughs> We often we often think that um, what people don't deserve, where they don't deserve punishment, you know, they they don't deserve to have bad things happen to them. But if we go back to Genesis chapter three, what we don't deserve is life. Right. Like from that moment forward, everything that yeah. happens is God's grace that isn't punishment or destruction. Right. And here, this is. This is just the consequences where God says, nope, 
enough. Uh, and he brings the punishment that he had already warned was going to happen. It wasn't like he didn't give a warning and it's kind of like, well, yeah. you guessed wrong. <laughs> yeah. And this is not a unique thing to the Old Testament. It is God, not. Because in the New Testament, we see people like uh, Ananias and Sapphira. That's right. Right. And, 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 it's, and it's interesting that it is in both cases at the establishment of the beginning of his people, right. the establishment of his covenant, where he is, I think, trying to tell us how seriously he takes his holiness and how seriously he takes right. his people, and he doesn't want it to be corrupted. Right. So this is an important thing, I, I think, for all of us to remember as we study God's word is is you never want to even just take one passage in isolation. We talk about context yep. a lot in Bible study, yep. but context is not only the verses around it. Context is context in the whole story of the Bible. Yeah. All right. So you talked about this idea of reflecting back to Genesis 3 yep. and that giving shape to how we even read the rest of the yep. Old Testament in the sense of, you know, well, everything he, is great. That's right, because God was very clear with Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit, you right. will die. Right. There, there wasn't like, if you eat the fruit, you'll die someday. Right. And so anything beyond the, and them eating the fruit and not dying right. is God being gracious. Right. So, <laughs> so that then shapes the way you read everything else right. in, in the grand story of it all, because, because it is God bringing grace uh, to bear for us. And like we see that continue to play itself out in the consecration of the priests mm -hmm. in chapter 29, right? Yeah. And you see this, um, uh, there's like an animal that gets brought into the mix That's right. with the priests. A bull and, and two rams. Right. So yeah. talk a little bit about that. Well, I, it, one of the things that is like you should see here if you read through it, something that should jump out to you is this laying on of hands that happens between Aaron and his sons and the bull and then the ram, this transference of guilt. Because we've talked about pictures pointing forward to Christ. Yeah. So we've talked about Christ as the ultimate priest, but in this passage we also see Christ as the ultimate sacrifice. Right. Right. The, here the sins of uh, the priests and the sins of the people need to be transferred onto animals because sin requires death. Yeah. And uh, I think it's Hebrews 9.22 that says basically in the Old Testament, the cleansing of sin requires blood all the time. <laughs> Which is kind of gory. It is. But, but then we come to Jesus, and we talked about this uh, at, uh, at Easter, right? Jesus is our ultimate yeah. Passover lamb. Here's the picture of our sins on the cross being transferred onto Jesus, him dying and those sins then finding uh, their ultimate uh, payment in Christ. And the reality is that none of the rams or the bulls or the sheep that would be slaughtered through all the years moving forward were sufficient to carry the weight of the sin. Mm -hmm. They were simply pointing forward to the need for a better sacrifice. Right. And even as Aaron and his sons transfer their sin and the sin of and guilt of the people onto these sacrifices, those sins are actually being ultimately transferred onto Christ. Christ died right. for their sins as well. They were not cleansed ultimately by a bull or by a ram because right. it wasn't sufficient. Right. But it was painting a picture of what was necessary, that sin requires death. Right. That a holy God cannot... Uh, look upon, have sin enter into its presence. It, it has to be dealt with. Yeah, so you have this amazing picture of of the people's sins are being carried by the priests, but then the priests, uh, they, they're, they're sinners, so yeah. they're passing it on to this animal, yeah. and still death has to happen for someone. Yeah. Right? So that's why the animal dies. Sin has to yeah. result in death always. Yeah. And it's just that, like you said, that beautiful picture of our sin being passed on to Jesus. I, I'm I'm in awe. Every time I read the passage in the New Testament that talks about he became sin. Yeah. To think about Jesus becoming my sin. So think about every sin you've ever committed. Mm -hmm. um, and then and think about all will. the sin, and, and never will commit. Yeah. And then think about the sins you don't even know you've committed because you're not even fully conscious of those sins. Yeah. 
and Jesus became that sin on the cross. Uh, that is, and then you take that not only for you, but for the lives of billions of people throughout human history. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a stunning weight mm -hmm. for one person to carry. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm really moved by this picture in chapter 29 of of the the way that sin is passed on to the animals and death happens uh, for the animals. And then what do they do with the, the blood to the priests there, Kirk? They are, what verse are we in? Uh, so was... 10 is, then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron, his son shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of right. the tent of meeting. And so then they take the bull and the bull's blood, they put it on... Uh, the altar to consecrate the altar that's going to have sacrifices laid yep. on it. And then they go to the sacrifice of the rams uh, in verse 19. To, and then I think it's in verse 20 where they start to take the blood of the rams and apply it to Aaron and his sons. Right. So now you've got this reality of uh, uh, things are being going in reverse. Yep. Right. Yeah, uh, and and so now this blood and we've talked about uh, in the past few weeks how blood uh, uh, forgiveness of sins requires the shedding of blood, mm -hmm. and so now blood is being passed back in the other direction to provide protection over the sins. Holiness is being passed back to the people yeah. through the death that has happened, and it's just this again amazing picture that through Jesus' death on the cross and Him taking and becoming our sin we then become the righteousness mm -hmm. of God, which, like, I do not feel righteous most days. Mm -hmm. um, but in God's eyes, because of Jesus, I am. Yeah. And so is anyone else who has put their faith in what Jesus has done for them. Yeah. Which is a radical, mind-blowing grace. Yeah. I, I love the fact that if you think about this setting and this picture, the... Aaron has gotten prettied up. Yep. Right? He's, yep. he's got this these beautiful garments that yep. have been put on that match the interior of the tabernacle. They've lit incense. So smelling good, yep. looking good, but it doesn't matter how good they look and how good they smell, they're not holy without blood. Yeah. And I just think about us. We try and pretty ourselves up. Mm. We try and make ourselves presentable to God, but it doesn't matter how pretty we might make ourselves how good we might think we smell to other people mm -hmm. until we've had the blood of christ applied to us we cannot enter into the presence of god why do you think we still do that even after we're believers oh man that is <laughs> that is a million dollar question i've thought about this some one i i think it is hardwired into us that we struggle to receive grace mm -hmm. and to actually believe that we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. um, I think we try and impress other people. Yep. Uh, you know, we are constantly living for the approval of other people, whether we admit it or not. We all do. Every single one of us yep. struggles with wanting to have the approval of other people. And I think we want to feel like we own some of our salvation. Yeah. <laughs> like that this is something that I have worked up in me. Yep. I don't know if you've got any other uh, thoughts you know what? or answers I've on that. I've wrestled with this as well. Yeah. I, I, and I think some of it is um, uh, there's still a part of our flesh that feels the shame of our sinfulness. Yeah. And there's still a part of us that feels the need to be like Adam and Eve in the garden and and putting fig leaves all yeah, over our bodies to to protect ourselves from yeah. the shame that we already feel because of our sinfulness um but boy like our story as christians is i'm messed up and need a savior yeah. like that is the core that's, of our story if you're a christian that's the thing you've confessed right? right it always drives me crazy that then we we start pretending with each other that we've got it all figured out and in so doing, we actually keep ourselves from becoming what God wants us to be by keeping our sin and our, our faults and our issues in, in the, the dark. dark and not bring them into the light so that we can find healing and wholeness. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, my hope is that as people wrestle through that kind of a th thought and that kind of temptation is that as a church community, we would um, we would set the tone of what it means to be a place where 
we can be real and open and honest mm -hmm. with with our sinfulness um, so that we can also be a people who extend grace to each other mm -hmm. and help each other to to walk with Jesus and receive from Jesus all that he wants to give yeah. to us. The gospel is good news before you're a Christian, and the gospel continues to be good news long after you are a Christian. It yeah. is good news for all of our life. And uh, I, I really, that would be one of my dreams for our church, yeah. is, is that we could be that kind of church where we can just be real and transparent be and be honest yeah. about about our sinfulness. Now, I would say this, let's not sugarcoat it either. Like, let's, call, yeah. let's call it sinfulness. Yeah. Let's call it sin. Let's, let's not just sit there and say, I had a bad day with this. Yeah. Like, yeah, you did, but it is sin and it needs God's forgiveness and it needs God to change you in some way uh, and make you more like Jesus. Yeah. And, and so, you know, let's be a church that's honest, but a church that also throws ourselves on the mercy seat of God mm -hmm. and and trust his goodness to shape us. And we're going to talk a little bit this week yeah. about rest and work yeah. and working from our rest. Yeah. And that includes our whole, the whole of our spiritual life, yeah. living out of our rest, living out of the rest that we have in Christ. So what is a little teaser yeah, for this, this um, coming week? I'm super excited about this week. Um, yeah. Anything else you wanted to bring up that's there? that just jumped out to you in the text, or you want to get to some practical takeaways for people? Uh, let's get to some practical takeaways. Okay. That's good. Okay. What What's one practical takeaway uh, that you'd like to leave? A uh, couple things. Well, one big thing that stood sure. out to me. Right at the very beginning in chapter 28, he talks about uh, the highly skilled workers that mm -hmm. are going to create the clothing for the priests. Yeah. And, uh, and so you've got this picture, both of what you were talking about a minute ago, about the priests who are all dressed up. Yep. And then you've got these highly skilled workers. I think that sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the gospel is for those dirty, rotten scoundrels who are like living, you know, who, who are alcoholics, drug addicts, mm -hmm. porn addicts. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who need the gospel. Yeah. Uh, the people who are the, the lower people in yeah. society. Yeah. Right? But what you have a picture of in these passages is, is um, people who are highly skilled at their jobs yeah. and people who are super spiritual in yeah. the priests, and neither of them are actually good enough to come into God's presence. Yeah. And, and so from a practical perspective, just to understand that the gospel and the message of the gospel is for all people at all times. Yep. Uh, the person who lives next door to you, who you think, ah, oh, they're pretty good, they don't really need the gospel. No, yeah. they need the good news of the gospel. Uh, the person who's you know driving the car you can't afford because they have a job doing things that you can't do, yep. they need the gospel. And, and so I, I just, I love how God just weaves into this the humanity of us all. No matter how skilled we are, or how spiritual we think we are, God weaves that into this story. Yeah. I, uh, for me, I was thinking about this reality is we, if we carry on uh, for what Christ has accomplished for us, that through Christ uh, in Second Peter, it says that we become a royal priesthood. Mm-hmm. So this beauty that we have direct access mm -hmm. into the throne room of heaven that the people of Israel could never imagine because of Christ, who is our high priest, who's seated at the right hand yep. of the Father. But the priesthood is sanctified and ordained to mediate the presence of God to the people. Yeah, And that means that it's not just this blessing and benefit that we have to enter into God's presence, but it's also an ordination and obligation that we have as a priesthood of people to serve God mm. in the world. Yeah. And so I, I, I was just spending some time. That's an thinking interesting about use of the that. word ordination. Yeah. Right. They use the Bible uses the word yeah. ordination around Aaron in this passage. Yeah. Most people think ordination is just for guys like just, you and me. It's just for missionaries, it's yeah. just for ministers, right? Yeah. But this idea, and this is one of the things that was uh, 
critical to the heart of the Reformation was recapturing this idea of the priesthood of all believers right. and breaking down the barrier between there's a sacred vocation and a secular yeah. vocation. And again, going back to that picture of the blood on on the on each part of yeah. the the priest, that the whole of us is sanctified and set apart for the purposes of God in That's this right. world. Yeah. And so as you go, you know, as our listeners, as they go out into their workplaces, into their families, that that they have been saved for a mission and a purpose to mediate the presence of God in those places. I just think it's really important for us to grasp. I know we're going to talk a lot about this in the fall, but I'm planting some seeds here that like, hey, we're to be a a people who are on mission for God everywhere that we're sent. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I one of the things I love about our church is we have peop we have a lot of people who get that. Yeah. And and just hearing the stories and seeing how people are living that out in schools and yeah. in workplaces. Uh I, I've had some people recently reach out to me and uh and talk about uh people that they work with and say like how how do I how do I share the gospel with people I work with? How do yeah. I bring Christ into my workplace? And I, I love that yeah. because that's where we are living every day. Like we're disciples of Jesus. Um, that Jesus didn't just come to make us better moral people. Yep. Um, but he came also to send us out on this mission to to bring that presence of God wherever we go. Well, this is you know two of my favorite verses in all of Scripture uh, are found. In Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one can boast. And uh, so often we forget this last part. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And I think it's so stunning to think that when God created you and then God saved you and brought you into the family. He he had things for you to do that right. only you can do. That's right. That Kirk can't do. I can't do. Yeah. Billy can't do. None of the staff here can do. No missionary. No one else that you're in your life group can do. Yeah. He's got a special mission yeah. on your life for some things that he wants to do specifically through you. And I just think, how cool is that? That is amazing, right? Yeah. So you talk about... God's plan for your life, yep. and yeah, they're right. you're right. There's those very specific things, yep. and I, I can't wait till we talk more about that this fall as yep. we move into our our series. It's going to be a great uh, time of encouragement for all of us. I think just in line with that, just to always remember this picture of God relating to His people and drawing us into mm-hmm. His presence that we see over and over again as yep. we walk through Exodus. God never intended it for it to only stay with the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. There is this consistent picture. Again, we talk about studying the Bible and looking at the story, the grand narrative of the Bible. There's this consistent picture of God bringing these blessings to his people for them to be a blessing to all nations, for them to help all nations to be able to see and, and, and to invite all nations to experience that same kind of presence yep. through Jesus. And yep. that, it's just a beautiful opportunity. We even saw it in the passage that you and I were both in this yeah. week at the very end. Yep. It says one of the reasons that altar is put up yeah. is so that all the nations would see the glory of God. That's right. That's right. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that the heart of our elders uh, in the church is to... Uh, see us be a church that continues to grow in, to use our language, serving the world Mm -hmm. so that the world around us would see that, that glory of God. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Uh, I think that is uh, it for us. If you got any questions you want to ask Pastor Kirk or I out of the passage, happy to handle those. Kirk G at forwardchurch.ca, Derek F at forwardchurch.ca, send them our way. Until next time, we will see you on Sunday. Have a great week, Rewind listeners.